Hello and welcome to ET Brand Equity presents The Big Leap powered by Clevertap. I'm your host Gautam Srinivasan and in this special series we will get you up close to the action in an arena where unicorns and conglomerates have shown metal and ingenuity in taking the big leap to go where not many businesses have gone before. Now, as part of this saga of growth and retention, 12 exciting brands chosen from different fields will share their secrets of success and excellence. So strap in for a roller coaster ride as we embark on this incredible journey. First up is a brand that leveled up from its small beginnings less than five years ago to become one of the world's leading mobile esports platforms with over 90 million users spread across Asia, North America, and Europe. This is the story of Mobile Premier League or MPL as it's popularly known. Offering over 60 games spanning fantasy sports to puzzles via virtual tournaments, the platform is a great case study into how retaining customers generates more value for a company by creating a virtuous cycle of growth. It's no surprise then that MPL reached unicorn status last year and is now valued at over $2 billion. So let's hear the growth story of MPL from its founders Shai Srinivas and Shubh Malhotra. <coughs> Sai, Shub, great to have you with us. And as it is with any story, we always come to the origins first to understand the growth. So let's start with you, Sai. From studying aeronautical engineering to leading Asia's largest esports and skill gaming platform, did you imagine taking this big leap since the 12 years it's been uh, since you graduated from IIT Kanpur? Uh, no, obviously, obviously <laughs> not. I think, yeah, I, I was sure of. Only one thing after uh, college is that I'll never do anything related to aerospace mm. or aeronautics. That I was sure of. I wasn't sure of anything else. So yes, definitely, uh, you know, no idea. We had no. I mean, I had no idea that you know, twelve years later, we'd be doing what we're doing today. Yeah. About the business bug, did you think you would fly high in business? Where did you get that sense that you could be a startup founder? Since you had decided that aeronautics is not where you're going. Yeah, I think. Uh, even in college, uh, one of the advantages of studying in IIT or similar institutions back in the day was that most people, what internet speeds we have today here, which we use quite, you know, happily and we're excited about it. IIT used to have those kind of internet speeds or even better, in fact, back in the day. So honestly, you had an opportunity to use, uh, you could see how, you know, how could you design products at when the world has that kind of internet speed. So. I think back then itself, we wanted to, at least I wanted to build internet products. Mm. So, and and I was very clear that I wanted to be involved in the internet product space. So, after my college or after four years, I actually took up a job as a product manager. Mm. And product manager, while today is a very common job, back then, nobody knew what product management was, right? So, I was very clear that we, I wanted to start building a product. Now, the only way you can build the products that you want is if you, you know, have the capital for it. Else you can, you know, keep thinking of 10 products, but you know, if you want to build it, then you need the capital. So eventually starting a company was a means to an end to make mm. that happen. So that gave you the grounding to be where you are, where you are right now. All right. Shubh, let me come to you. Your alma mater, uh, Bitspilani, has quite an active esports culture. Were you into gaming or did you have any inkling that one day you'd be leading a gaming unicorn? I think not, to be honest, just like Sai said, I think, I think I, at, at campus, I think one thing that I was doing was observing gamers and I was the moderator for running game servers. So that's the, that's, that's the small bit that I used to do at campus. I think for me, the journey has always been uh, iterative in nature. Uh, the idea was to uh, join a startup uh, right off the bat, uh, to build things in a small, a small setup. Uh, and joined the startup just after college. Any particular memory that lingers on and during that time, which kind of shaped who you are today? One thing, one thing which shaped me, which helped me in building products from there on was was mostly around that uh, 
uh, you can build technology, but uh, having an understanding of business is also very, very key and important. And customers are always uh, first. All right. Let's know more about the origins of MPL. I believe things started in a rooftop with drivers who worked with both of you, games loaded on their mobile phones and off they went. So take us through, you know, the early experiences, the early conversations with folks who would be your potential customers and how it kind of shaped thinking of MPL, right? Your thoughts. Actually, the funny thing is we weren't thinking of calling it MPL mm -hmm. in the beginning. We were thinking of calling it, uh, I think, M League or something. Okay. okay? And I think uh, Shubh sent an email saying that, uh, uh, you know, everybody in India knows what IPL is. Everybody in the world knows what EPL is, English Premier League. Mm -hmm. We should be MPL. Mm -hmm. And I think I remember him saying that there's this URL also available. So I was like, yeah, that's, that's MPL. <laughs> that's how the name started. Uh, and our thing always was that, uh, you know, we wanted to see without actually writing code or without actually uh, building a product, we wanted to see if this thrill of competition is mm -hmm. something that would make uh, people stick and something that would make people like enjoy, mm -hmm. right? And at the end of the day, it's that competition. So I think what we did was that we got a bunch of folks. I think there's this person who used to make food at my place. And then mm -hmm. there's a person who used to work at my friend's place and Shub's place. We got all of them together. And we basically put up a simple whiteboard uh, and we got them to play a simple runner game mm -hmm. where you just run endlessly, right? And the whole thing was... Uh, the first variant that we played was whoever is going to run uh, for the longest without you know dying, right? You know? So that was the first variant, and then we put their and we got them to play free of cost for the first time, right? And the first two times they played free of cost, and then the third time we said, okay, this time you got to pay a small entry fee to to play. And then I think about eight or nine of them, but a couple of them said we won't, mm -hmm. but the other guys said they will, mm -hmm. right? And they put a small entry fee. Right? So, we collected the entry fee and then they again played, right? And then we put their scores on the leaderboard again. And it was quite transparent. Everybody could see who was doing what, right? And we were seeing the scores on their phone. And then it went on for the third time, fourth time, and then it kept going on for like the next two, two hours. I think then we were fairly convinced that there's meaningful product market fit here, mm. right? At least from a very, very top-down sense. Like when you see a person, when you see a group of people enjoying competition, and you and and you can't fake enjoyment. You know what I mean. After a point, you'll know if something's fun or something's not, right? So we thought that there was something really good there, and it it made a lot of sense. Uh, and and that's how that's how you know MPL was born. And then after that, we didn't look back. We're like, yes, now we're doing. <laughs> now this. you have it. Yeah. Now we're doing think, this. I think a lot of that. Then actually, the first version of the product was almost those constructs were there as features in the product. Take um, us through that because when you you guys launched in September 2018 and. Uh, Right. So, I think a million uh, daily active users uh, uh, yeah. within a very short span of time, four months. So, take us through that experience and the challenges that you faced, especially now that you had to sort of market on a scaling up level, omni-channel marketing campaigns, all that. So, the challenges that you faced and how did you kind of create this virtual, virtual cycle of revenue retention? Because at the end of the day, when you earn money, you make the platform better. The platform is better, more players come in. And therefore, it makes for a more robust multiplayer gaming experience. I think the first step for us was, was building a product uh, which will where people will spend more and more time. So, I think the first thing for us was uh, getting not just one game, but probably multiple games right. And that was the first thing that we did. And the idea was always to improve gameplay because people are not going to be loving gameplay and they're not going to spend time on competing on those uh, on those games as such as well so i think the first thing was that when we went out and brought in developers the idea was always to build mpl as a platform for developers mm -hmm. wherein developers can publish their gaming content and we can monetize them and also make them money uh, at the same time as such as well so that was one part uh, as well as, I think, uh, coming back to how we went about uh, garnering that kind of marketing, I think it was all it was all Gorilla and kudos to uh, members and the early early founding team, mm. which went out and and did a lot of YouTube influencer uh, campaigns, mm. wherein uh, more and more people just talked about and created and talked about the experience that they are having. It was more word of mouth driven by certain sect of influencers. 
and that's how we could gather gather such a large audience but gaming is also a sort of a pull experience yes. for brands right so you'll get a lot of data coming in from your users so any insights from that data during that initial jump which you saw of a million users in four months that I you think, would like to share yeah i think i think to be honest i think from that perspective one thing which we learned very very quickly is that there is appetite for more and more categories Mm. people just know like people playing games and then then people probably want to play fantasy sports as well yeah. people want to play in another category of a game so category expansion was very very important for us because people people were when we were doing that uh, it was backed by data mm. that people are actually involved in more and more categories so the more categories we uh, launch on mpl uh, the the time spent increases yeah. and i think the other thing which we which we also figured out was the fact that our monetization multiplies uh when people spend more and more time uh, on the app it's not just like for example if you're going to compete once then you're going to compete more and you're going to compete more uh, so that also was an insight earlier and probably sai can share more insights on sure this. and we'll we'll dwell on that as we also explore how say partners helped you in understanding that data and helping you and helped you monetize that data but i want to take one aspect of what you mentioned which is the developers and connecting game developers with users that's something people had not brands had not done before and you kind of capitalized on that opportunity you bring over 60 games now to audiences here connecting indian and international developers so tell us about how you capitalized on that gap why did you feel that bridging that gap would help you grow bigger yeah so i think i think see at the end of the day uh, like content is uh, you know endless right you know there's infinite amounts of content and uh, users are always looking out for newer and newer types of games and newer and newer types of uh, content to engage with there's only so much you can make content by yourself right eventually you would need partners you would need uh, developers to make content so we knew right at the get go that making a developer platform is not a 3 year or a 4 year journey but it's a massive 8 10 year journey and we wanted to ensure that we constantly keep pushing towards that so we started by getting small developers you know two people uh, teams three people teams where we used to actually work with them to make the game happen and then we used to publish that game on mpl yeah. and then we used to take the headache of bringing the customers and building the competition layers and so on and so forth the top of it and yeah and over a period of time we started getting developers we also started ensuring that we build a lot of first party content but at the end of the day what matters is the customers got to have variety in content yeah. else you know if you go to a shopping mall and everywhere you see a food court then you wouldn't be interested in going to the shopping mall right the reason why people go to a mall is they get to see they get to eat a sandwich they get to you know buy a pair of socks watch a movie mm. do everything right so that's essentially the philosophy that we took with mpl right like you know if you are the shopping mall then you got to get as many different ways to engage people as possible and they are within your mall so they have a variety of yeah. experiences within your mall rather than stepping outside would you call that your secret recipe for success the fact that all these developers the more they work with you the more they're comfortable with you and of course they can bring others on board as well word of mouth you could say or the word of the brand if they are successful with that experience it it gets more talented developers on board as well 100% and it's a, it's a ladder right you you can't expect uh, the biggest game developer in the world to come and publish on the platform on the get go right it's a ladder so you start with smaller developers then build more credibility build more value and then you keep going up and up and up and hopefully mm. like i said you know in the next 3 4 years you'll have some of the best dev- developers in the world also uh, publishing on mpl all right now let's look at the data side of the equation which we were talking about shub so when it comes to retention and a lifetime value of a customer one of the unique selling points of your platform is also the upskilling aspect of it because the user gets better in their game they are more likely to stay on longer and play that game more or at least try a variety of games so take us through some of the unique insights which data enabled for you uh considering you're getting data from across platforms which helped mpl encourage users to increase their gameplay time and kind of stood out from the competition and you know the role of partners here i don't think the word i think <laughs> sure Sure. Yeah. Take your probably side you can answer. Side you want to take this one? Yeah, yeah I think I think uh, the most uh, important thing data is that I think it's easy to collect a lot of data mm-hmm. but the harder thing is actually I think responding to that data. Yeah. What I mean is uh, I think uh, in the beginning uh, you know uh, as, especially as a young company you just don't have the ability to build large scale data infrastructure and manage that data infrastructure and respond to data very very fast and I think that's where i think uh, at least in the early days uh, 
clever tap was very very useful in the sense that uh, where you know we could very easily target users either based on certain segment or saying that you know if Gotham played a game yesterday between 6 to 8 pm why don't you actually send Gotham a notification today <laughs> between 6 to 8 pm and like you know get Gotham to come back into the app I'm, I'm, I'm trivializing it but you know what I'm just giving you very basic examples of how it could be used and uh, you know data is available at scale everywhere the the toughest thing is to react to it how quickly can you react to it and I think uh, at least in the early days that was that was definitely very very useful mm. yeah and I, for a gaming I mean company progress as from early days to now how has that association with say partners like Clevertap helped you understand your customers better I mean it uh, uh, I think more than understanding our customers better it it definitely helps us reach out to our customers in a more efficient manner and I think I think that's where that's where it's been very very helpful for us. I mean, of course, you got to understand the customer to uh, you know uh, you can't sell a comb to a bald man, right? <laughs> like, yeah, so you have to understand the customer only then you can know the customer and know what to sell to the customer. Exactly right. So so uh, I think CleverTap especially was very very helpful in reaching out to the customers at the right time and doing it in a way which is easy for your teams to understand, right? You know, you can't make it a rocket science dashboard for people to understand. It has to be simple for people to understand how to use it and stuff. So in that way, it was definitely very helpful. Any implication from a monetization perspective? Because at the end of the day, user retention has a direct impact on monetization. Yeah, it's like, right? see, it's like the amount of money a shop makes is a function of the number of people who show up at the shop, right? So by the very fact that, you know, you're using a tool to bring more people to the to to, to the shop, hmm. uh, it, it impacts monetization. If you if you're not targeting the right set of users, then automatically it, it does impact your monetization. Also, I think I think I think building those customer journeys is very very important in today's world. Hmm. I mean, all customers are uh, have very less attention span. That's so it's very important for uh, for an, for a digital product like us hmm. to kind of uh, keep coming back to the user with with the right with the right you can say activity to do keep coming back to them in a journey fashion like you were you probably you're a new user you need to come back to you on day three with something different compared to your old user been playing let's say for for let's say 90 days on the platform so all of that also helps a lot with with let's say something like clever, clever data so let's explore that thought further how do you keep your eyes on the price and keep the user at the center of everything that MPN does i think data plays is definitely a very very important part in that mm -hmm. uh, i mean making sure that uh, data is is near real time and you're able to act on those insights near real time like for example if at all you you're playing a game and you just ended a game i mean which is the next game that we offer you to play okay and against whom so mm -hmm. data definitely plays and real time data plays a very very important part uh, in in today's world as such any specific use cases which have caught your interest in terms of say user outreach where things you did with let as as you mentioned clever tap that helped you kind of get more user interest. You saw a significant uptick in installs or prevented uninstalls. Any any use case that you could cite for us? I think something that is very important for for for, for digital products is 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 fraud mm. uh, as such. So I think that's one aspect where where we have gone very very deep uh, into into kind of identifying uh, how can how can we prevent uh, let's say uh, game plays which are not proper on a platform and that's something which we really really focus a lot on with respect to our our, our platform as such yeah. and i think most people you know tend to make this mistake that data tells you what to do mm. more often than not actually data tells you what not to do okay right if data were to tell you exactly what to do then i don't think this face for <laughs> then, i mean then we don't need human beings right absolutely, like right yeah. data fundamentally tells you hey don't do this 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 now you have these three options pick one amongst these three. So that's where the, you know, the human intuition comes in. So I think a lot of people tend to use data to say, you know what, it's going to tell me precisely this is what I'm going to do. No, mm. it will tell you don't do this, don't do this, don't do this because there's definite dead ends there, right? So, so the rest is where the human intelligence come in, comes into the picture. So Especially in cross-selling, would you say, because you, you mentioned in an interview, right, that uh, it's the worst if a user uses an app, signs up, uses an app for a month and then churns out. It's better if they churn out in a day or two. Yeah. So yeah. here is where humans and data marry together to offer something which is valuable for the customer, yeah. cross-sell and upsell possibly. Yeah, I'll give you an example of what I mean by like, you know, uh, if you want to go to Delhi from Bangalore, you have to keep moving north right uh, that's basically human intelligence right 
data is basically telling you where to take a left, where to take a right, and that's fundamentally if you're using a maps product or something like that. So that's an analogy to how it would play out in the product is that if Shub played caroms, mm. the probability that you know Shub would like pool is pretty high. Mm. It assumes so, right? Data will prove whether that thesis is right or wrong. Mm. And whether indeed Shub likes pool or maybe Shub likes some other game, right? So mm -hmm. that's that's pretty much how data da data can be used. And especially in gaming, right? You can't make everything about while everything is about data. Yeah. A lot of it is actually not about data. A lot of it is truly understanding the subjective side of the customer, truly understanding whether the customer truly enjoys the game and so on and so forth. Data will give you signals. Data mm -hmm. will also tell you this, but also there's a lot of subjective elements to it, right? So so it's a combination of these two things that uh, that that definitely you know plays a big role and on the comment on like you know uh, uh, a customer is better churned off in a single day and then i hold that true right you know it's because nobody can make a product that's applicable for everyone in the world mm. right there's always products that like if, for example if you're not in the mood to purchase something and an e-commerce website is probably not your place right uh, the only place where it doesn't hold true is gaming because everyone or the other will play some or the other game in their life life cycle right mm. So in MPL, our goal is to eventually get to that point where we have all the games. But till then, it becomes very important that if a user is not interested, fine, it's okay. You know what? Let's at least focus on the users who are interested. Then yeah. our energy, our time, everything is going on the users and the customers who, who who will create value for us and also for themselves. So you never left being a product manager. I can see that you still <laughs> talk like a product manager. But you look at the approach and say that this is what actually works for the product. Yes. So let's look at it in that context. But as you scale up, then the question comes, how do you manage that scale, right? I think within a year, you guys were 25 million and now we are at 90 million. So that scale also makes automated segmentation an important factor in understanding your customers. So take us through that, Shubh. How do you manage this scale and yet do so well in connecting with your users and making them drive more users in? I think to be honest, I mean, tools definitely help. I mean, mm -hmm. and I think from a segmentation standpoint, and there's there's a lot of there's a lot of science now also, which mm -hmm. which which comes into picture. I mean, data is not now just about data engineering and the plumbing of data, but also science and models and and machine learning models. Wherein I think coming from size example, I think there's so one is one is okay. You can take a left and you can take another left, mm -hmm. but if at all a feedback loop comes and tells that the second left is is okay. wrong. Uh, so the feedback loop is where the machine His expression learning, says it all. Is where the is where the machine learning and, and and data science is coming into picture. So I think segmentation is now more and more moving from let's say uh, a rule based segmentation to more machine driven uh, segmentation where the machine can actually tell you okay for this kind of an outcome uh, this is what the rules which should be applied and keep measuring them because there's no one rule which can tell whether uh, uh, whether Gotham is gonna gonna probably uh, do an X activity or a Y activity or a Z activity. So um, you're working with external providers for this as well from that automated segmentation. So we're doing we're doing a lot of this work in house. Mm -hmm. uh, we've created a large data engineering team uh, in house and a data science team mm -hmm. which which carries on a lot of uh, a lot of this work. And that was a conscious decision. Yeah. You wanted to keep it in. -house. Yeah. Yeah. So that's also IP at the end of the day, right? Like for a gaming that's company. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Also, I think I think I think to be honest, is like building those in-house at times, I mm. mean, is important because as you said, IP is wherein you can customize a lot of that. That's true. I'm just looking at the time cases. frame, right? Yeah. Because in such a short time you guys grew so exponentially, which would make you wonder, did you have time to set things up in-house? No, I think I think I get to answer that, I think not in the beginning. Exactly. Definitely not in the beginning. Nah. So if yeah. if you'll ask me from an ROI standpoint, I mean, not in the beginning. I mean, because in the beginning you have you you want to learn from from simple segmentation. You you learn from an equation before you move to a model. To be honest, I mean, every model is also an equation at the end of the day. A bunch of variables, but when you multiply the number of variables, that's where a model is required uh, as such. So not at the beginning, definitely not. But I think as we grow, as 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 the amount of data grows, the kind of customer grows, the kind of categories grew inside the platform. That's why we felt that. We need something which is also in-house, complementing alongside the rest of the tools available in the market. All right, let's let's go back to the CX side of things. So tell us how, say, something like a fair play, which is unique, is making your gaming experience more enjoyable for a user. Again, as I mentioned earlier, virtuous cycle. The user enjoys it because they're paired with the right kind of players and they know that these players are legit. 
and so therefore they are actively invested in the game and they encourage others to join in as well tell us a bit more about fair play i think that's something which is really really key for a gaming platform uh, wherein uh, wherein you are paired with people of your skill so we have built a lot of proprietary algorithms which help us match people with with particular skill so for example if gautam has uh, a skill score of x and, and sai has a skill score of y and they are close to each other that's when we match them because that's when we believe a close match will happen a close fight will happen everybody <laughs> everybody in gaming enjoys that which games do we both of you guys play i'll try and avoid it <laughs> i suspect yeah, you guys yeah. are ranked up way no, above no, no, we don't we don't unfortunately yeah. we can't play on it you don't have time yeah, for yeah, games yeah. is it yeah. Yeah. yes so i think i think i think to add to that i think like one is matchmaking is mm. very very key wherein you are matched with people who are almost of your skill that's very very important i think second is also probably as in gaming since it's digital you are uh, there are ways in which people can have impact can change gameplays and impact scores and that is also something where we built a lot of data science and machine learning stuff which identifies whether you are actually uh, doing something wrong during the gameplay and we identify that and make sure that gotham is playing against a player like that mm. we 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 reward back more mm. than what gotham came in for because as a platform uh, we we were not able to give the best experience out there so yeah. that's that's very very important and that and fair play doesn't just mean the part a that i talked about is matching you with but if we identify that something has gone wrong we we'll also do kind of go back and and make that wrong a right Uh, it makes it gives you e- equity with the user that yes, here is a platform yeah. which is actually doing yes. something because this is something yes. which has plagued the gaming universe right yeah, and, and in fact this yeah issue. and in fact just to kind of add to that like in a world where uh usually you see in marketing campaigns where people are sh- shouting at the top of their voices <laughs> on prize money saying this is the prize money that is the prize money come play this app come try this app i think what was interesting to stand out was that recently we did a uh, we did a campaign mm. where the the number that we were shouting out was zero mm-hmm. and we basically said we assure you there's zero uh fraud mm-hmm. complete fair play and the response we got for that campaign was probably two times higher than the response you would even get during ipl mm-hmm. yes and that's the amount of concern that players have with respect to fair play mm-hmm. i think they want things to be fair they don't want fraud they don't want to go to a place where they're being cheated right yeah. and and if the fact that you did a campaign during what i'd consider lean months the you know this mid months like may, june july may june july august uh and we got a response which is probably twice as high twice as much as what you'd get during ipl mm-hmm. you'd know that how big of a problem that is in 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 the ecosystem in india and that gave us all the more you know enthusiasm to even go even further and try to like hopefully take it to as close to zero as possible because technically you know zero means 0.000001 mm. right so you got to add more zeros after the point to make it even better yeah it's the context of what you do right because yeah. there it's not jargon that you're speaking you're actually doing something which yeah. makes the gaming experience more enjoyable yep and of course then comes ambition you do what you do you do it very well but the next step and mpl has big ambition so let me quote a tweet that you wrote uh, you said that india has to be a net exporter of content our stories are wonderful bollywood's done it tollywood is killing it hopefully gaming is next in this context i believe you know you guys are you have big triple a gaming plan so if you could take us through that and why enter this space because it is a high risk high cost space so what's the thinking behind going into triple a games and the role that you see it playing in retaining customers for npl sure see i think uh, from our perspective uh, the way we see it is that every uh, you know every every gaming platform uh, or should i say every gaming ecosystem needs good quality local games or local content to engage their users yeah. for example imagine india without bollywood movies or imagine india without tollywood movies and there were only these uh, american movies or british movies that were running in our theaters dubbed hypothetically right would are you would are would our viewers enjoyed they probably not they probably hate it right and not hate it they'd be like that's the only thing available we'll watch it big <laughs> deal right you know there's no entertainment we'll watch it but but at the end of the day if you in in a market like that if you produce a world class story built on a uh, solid indian fundamentals and indian premises mm-hmm. right i think it would it would it would really kill it and that was the thesis with which we 
said, you know, we should we should start work on Mayhem, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why we announced Mayhem Studios, right? And the reason why we announced Mayhem Studios is because exactly what you said, right? It's high risk, high reward, right? If we, as a company, have been fortunate enough to get to the scale that we've gotten to in four years, mm -hmm. right? If we don't take this risk, then well, who is going to take this risk, right? I mean, if we can take the risk, we can be patient, we can build the game. Even if it takes longer, that's fine. We've got to put the time and energy behind it. Mm -hmm. But once, uh, you know, once that, once the game goes out the door and people actually, you know, uh, play, start playing the game, I think after that, it just becomes a floodgate. Everyone else, it's like this, it's the same thing, right? We needed one flip card back in the day to start. And then after that, you had 100, 200 companies coming after that, right? And also, just so you know, the game that we announced, I mean, the comments that we've received on the game mm -hmm. uh, and the kind of feedback we've gotten on it is crazy. I mean, of course, we know after all this also, we might ship this game and it might end up being a dud, but that's fine. That's it's the experience also which teaches you on maybe it could improve something with the native platform. Yeah, and if you look at globally, if you look at it globally, I think there are only four or five companies which are capable of making AAA games on mobile, just mm -hmm. four or five companies. So, in our view, it's a capability that we're building. If we build that capability, then, you know, then it's endless, right? Because you can make so many great games on these great stories. Like if you take even OTT in India, right? All the content that create started getting created around Indian stories ended up becoming so big. Mm. It's just the no. It's also the, offshoot. Like if you take the example of a Witcher or something. I mean, that's from a PC universe. But you have ancillary media also yeah. gaining yeah. prominence. So I understand that logic. Let's also look at it from a forward-looking direction. The sport that you look forward to in terms of driving growth for uh, for MPL. And in this context, you clarified in an interview that uh, fantasy sports contributed less than 10% during the yeah. period where you saw huge 22x growth from start to I think FI21. Uh, the top performing game in your opinion was Ludo and I believe Carom and Bridge. These were all popular and I believe MPL is also working with the chess tour. They have a chess tour and chess just, uh, I mean, as a game is getting more popular and Olympia just uh, got completed. So which sport are you banking on to drive user growth and retention from here on? Sport from a point of view of making a game or sport from a point of view of advertising? Uh, from making a game and from advertising, if you can share. Right. I think from making a game, I think uh, we would would spend a lot of time in building uh, games, which is more, uh, I'd say, first person shooter kind of games. Mm. I think those games tend to have very high, you know, engagement and they're also high, you know, you can build great puzzles around them, mm. right? Uh, in terms of more casual, I think we would definitely look at uh, puzzle games, mm. board and card. I think board and card games are like really, really good. And there's some incredibly good strategy board and card games. And those would be the games that would go after. I think on advertising, I think honestly, cricket's overrated. Mm. We, we, everybody told us for three years, you have to advertise on cricket. You have to advertise on cricket. And we advertised on cricket for three years, spent a lot of money. And then in the fourth year, we said, you know what? We got to call this bluff at least once. And we said, we're going to stop advertising on cricket. Trust me, it's the best decision we made. The money gave us 3x returns. It's much better spent. So I can't tell you which sport am I banking on when it comes to advertising. <laughs> I'd probably have to figure out other places to advertise. But uh, this is just our take. Yeah. yeah. Shubh, your thoughts on mm. this? I think for me, a lot of people are spending time now in front of uh, their mobile screens. Mm. So it needs to become more and more digitally machine driven. Uh, oriented as such rather than just banking on events. Events are definitely important for sending the message out at the top of your voice. But at the end of the day, it, it matters that how are you reaching your users consistently? Your thoughts on structuring the organization in the sure. right way? Sure. I think from, a, from, from, let's say, from a growth perspective, from a user acquisition standpoint perspective, I think in the initial days, it's very important to build a brand as well and mm. be at the top yeah. of your voice so that people remember you. I mean, that's where, that's where for example, uh, uh, you have to have brand ambassadors. You probably have to go uh, at an IPL. But eventually, people like eventually businesses need to realize that it needs to be more and more data driven, and that's what is the approach that we have taken. I mean, we are very. You can say that for us, the the view and the lens that we take, both of us, is that we need to keep evolving. It cannot be that this is the way today and it cannot be tomorrow. So even the way, even the way today, wherein we can say that we will want to be more and more data driven, it needs to be balanced out and relooked at probably in the future. So it's always in the 
ever evolving journey hmm. and that's how we structure it like okay and so in that ever evolving journey uh, just to add yeah, so yeah, you sorry. can answer uh you mentioned that you know the market is pivoting from say growth at all costs yeah. to profitable growth so to take it forward from what uh, shubh had mentioned your thoughts on this especially and on how you're kind of gearing up for a post pandemic world you are spread in over 5000 cities in towns in india you've expanded in north america europe yeah. so take us through that in the post pandemic market where it's more about uh, not growth at all costs i think people need to realize that any market is looking for good roi on whatever marketing dollars you put in mm. right when you are a young company when you've just started you are most probably a very new value proposition nobody in the world knows about your value proposition then going large scale on television makes a lot of sense because it's like nobody knows and you're telling the whole world and you'll get very high roi mm. but you've done it for one year you've done it for two years you've done it for three years then people already know right then repeating the same message again and again and again on television is probably going to be very very low roi right mm -hmm. so at that point your ability to target digitally and your ability to do that at scale using algorithms and you know using better data science becomes very important else you would end up spending millions of dollars you know marketing but you would probably not get the right roi mm -hmm. right but if you were to spend that million dollars on saying okay what are the users i'm going after which which part of the country should i go after which kind of segments do i go after uh, you know what kind of games is this user should be playing etc so on and so forth all of this can be done far more efficiently effectively with much better roi using data science and data right so that's what he means when he says evolving right if we do all this data science when we were like say one year old <laughs> company it would be it would be it would be a waste of time at yeah. that time going on tv was the right yeah. thing going on cricket was the right thing to do yeah. right for example yeah. now like the, like another evo evolution in that like an example of that is we are taking data and applying that to brand marketing mm. so we are saying that probably these are the cities in which we need to be on print media mm. and, and this is all coming out of data and it's giving us massive amount of results rather than be saying that okay we'll go in a particular state and do print ads in 100 cities mm -hmm. we probably know only five cities are going to work so we're going to do five cities conserve a budget and still get a better better roi but yeah. it's also brave of you to kind of rewrite the rules of the game because as you said you in your to. time <laughs> everyone said you have to invest in this sport and you will get all the returns and the data showed you that's not exactly the case but you still have to make that decision and say yeah, that you're going yeah. to different direction. no i think that's that's the that's the cost of running a company right you can't use a bazooka everywhere right you, you need a <laughs> you, you need a scalpel for yeah. some and a bazooka yeah for yeah, yeah yeah and the other way of looking at it is that if few houses in a city need water you can't make it rain all over the all over the city <laughs> right it doesn't make sense right so yeah <laughs> well that that that's true especially of mumbai where we <laughs> but it rains all over mumbai <laughs> anyways all through uh, you know all through monsoon every every year yeah. all right so as we head to the last leg of the conversation you you've come quite far in a very short period of time a lot of our viewers are startup founders so i want to know from you some of the lessons that you learned in this very exciting journey which happened over a very short period of time yeah. so for those who are watching uh, any lessons in excellence that you'd like to share sai i think first is always hire specialists mm -hmm. rather than generalists uh that's been our core philosophy and what we mean by specialist is that hire a person who knows what they're doing <laughs> rather than them coming and learning on the job because if you as a startup you have very little money right you have to spend that money on the right things you can't get people who don't know what they're doing and even if it means you have to pay a little more that's absolutely okay but get a specialist don't get a generalist I think the second thing uh you know uh what do you call it? the second key takeaway that uh, I can say is that uh speed is very important if you're a young company else there's no no difference between you and a large company like a Microsoft or a Google or anyone right you know speed is your moat you have to have to move fast so those would be my two uh, all right yeah hire specialists and always have the need for speed that's the lesson in excellence coming from Sai Shubh your thoughts on some lessons that you would like to share to our viewers many sure. of whom could be budding entrepreneurs i think i think i think learning from our own experience of doing one uh, earlier and then not being able to like kind of scale it and then starting mpl after that i think the one which stands out for me is uh, outcome is more important than output uh, 
uh, like especially a lot of lot of startup founders in India are engineering uh, engineers uh, and engineering focus. I think we tend to go towards output. It's like how much are we how much are we doing? But at the end of the day, is it actually impacting business? Is actually impacting users? Is very 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 important. And getting all the units of, of of the team together on that single single focus outcome rather than output uh, is is very very important. I think the next thing is 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 probably about is as you said is is momentum. Mm. Uh, momentum is very very key, and uh, you just need to yeah. kind of do speed and mass and just go forward. <laughs> He's right. right, actually, it's more than speed. Momentum. Momentum, momentum. is. Making everybody in your team move in the same direction. Mm. Uh, speed is basically people moving, but <laughs> momentum is everybody. But moving. that's especially true of startup founders, right? When you speak of momentum, you guys need to be perfectly in sync. And true. considering you both of you have started multiple startups with each other, how do you kind of avoid the conflicts which folks usually see in the startup world between co-founders which emerge? How do you have a good working relationship? Any lessons that you'd like to share there? Shu? I think. I mean. Like for 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 me and Sai, we have been together now for. I think the only person that exceeds that is my wife. <laughs> <laughs> so we spent. I think I think it's a lot of time uh, which has gone through that. And I think I think holding ourselves towards the kind of principles that we set for the company actually helps us probably drive our relationship as well. Like okay, yeah. if at all both of us are going to be focused on outcome versus output, both of us are going to be momentum focused. Uh, all the cultural uh, things that we agree on, uh, if both of us have the buy-in in that, in that, I think there is far more less conflict. That's right. Uh, What's the hallmark of a good working relationship? I think basis your yeah. Experience? I think I think as long as the company comes first, uh, and I think uh, that will be fine. And you will usually things will be fine. Usually, what happens is when you know when founders, or at least this is what I've seen. When founders or senior executives tend to believe that they are bigger than the company, is when things start rapidly, you know, breaking. As long as the company comes first, and company coming first means like you know, if tomorrow if someone else is better, bet is a better choice to do this job than me, and that's absolutely fine. And that's what that's how we look at it. Right at the end of the day, outcome. If we are make if the business is doing well, then all of us are automatically you know doing well. All right. On that note, we'll wrap up our conversation. Wonderful to hear so many insights being shared. And as you said, the company comes first. That kind of is the common thread between both of you successfully starting multiple startups with each other. Thank you, Sai and Shu for sharing with us the growth story, an exponential growth story at that for MPL and how it makes users want to come back. For more, thank you so much for sharing with us your insights, and of course, for many of our viewers who themselves might be thinking of starting a business someday, these insights could serve as a great reference. Well, now that we know about the growth story of MPL, it's time now to get an inside perspective on their investment journey as well. In India, mobile gaming is growing faster than social media with a user base of over 300 million. Now, the lockdown year saw the market growing annually by nearly 40% and projections indicate revenues touching $5 billion by 2025. Now, investment in a mobile gaming venture might seem like a great bet for VCs now, but was that always the case? Let's find out the investment story behind MPL with Bhavani Rana of SIG Venture Capital. Bhavani, great to have you with us. Uh, let me ask the first question to get a deeper understanding of the investment story. Now, MPL raised money before the company even got started and it almost had the same set of investors from the previous venture. So, in your opinion, what was, uh, you know, how was the initial meeting happening between the founders and you and what was your reading of yeah, sure. So, Gautam, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, the uh, company was fortunate to have uh, received its initial uh, investment from the same set of uh, investors who had backed the founders on the prior venture and largely on account of their successful relationship from there. We first met the company in 2019 and we were really impressed with the management team and particularly the, the, the depth they had. Uh, for such a well-rounded uh, team at this scale that they were operating at. And so that was one of the uh, aspects that we really liked because we just saw the immense 
opportunity of optionality that could play out here. So we met them in 2019 and, you know, from what was a, a, a few brief meetings uh, and I was joined by the founders of uh, Susquehanna as well, we got to see very clearly what possibly, if you could connect the dots, what this, how big this could be and we were fortunate then to uh, uh, invest uh, in them. From there, uh, the company actually, you know, did well, but it was largely in the 2020, uh, first the pandemic, that they really uh, blossomed and hit their stride. And we were uh, already in the company, so we had the option to see how quickly, if we gave them capital, uh, it would be used very advantageously. And so mm -hmm. that's how our journey started with them, and it's, it's worked really well since then. Absolutely. And now the pandemic did give a big boost, especially when it came to mobile gaming trends in the country. Now, considering mobile gaming still mostly veered towards the freemium model, what was your uh, assessment of MPL's core value proposition and monetization strategy? Yeah, I, let me answer that slightly tangentially. You know, there, there was a famous bank robber, uh, Willie, Willie Sutton, who okay. was asked, why did you rob the banks? And he said, well, that's where the money was. <laughs> and when you look at the immense gaming potential we have in the country with the number of users in the country, you actually look at the fact that real money gaming if, is where the money is. And so we decided uh, very early on that this was a team that was focused on uh, actually going to where uh, monetization was much easier. You could create a freemium strategy and try and create a pathway for uh, eventual monetization. But if you could collect the money up front and you could participate in that income stream uh, very early on, uh, you know, we made immense sense for us. And so this is a, a game of skill, a platform where uh, if uh, the participants have demonstrated the right skill, um, they participate in the economic su success and MPL as a facilitator for that is joining in that economic stream. Mm, absolutely. And it's touted to be a sort of a $5 billion opportunity within 2025. So in terms of broader economic trends, it is shaping up to that. Let me also look at uh, the user retention strategies, because when it comes to multiplayer gaming, obviously, the more the number of players, uh, the more attractive the platform is uh, for a user. So your assessment of the user retention strategies that uh, MPL uses, what was your view of, you know, where MPL stood out from its competitors, especially when it came to user retention? Yeah, so I, uh, I think that's a great qu question to sort of you know, dig into. So most gaming companies spend a lot of money to act acquire and then there's a natural decay that comes with their retention of their cohorts. And uh, uh, MPL's uh, journey on retention has been one of evolution. Uh, and that is a competitive strength that they've had because it's a demonstration of that rate of learning that they, they keep maintaining. To answer the question of how retention gets done, you would look at the starting with uh, reconstructing the, the game itself. So you, you need to have uh, the game, the gameplay, the way you sequence uh, the activities to be fun, engaging, but still rewarding. Mm -hmm. And then when you've launched it, you also have uh, the possibility that you will have people who are disproportionately skillful in that area who will be matched incorrectly uh, with somebody who's not as skillful. And if you don't do that matching appropriately, mm. then the person who has been matched with someone who's a white belt and you put them against a black belt, <laughs> it's pretty hard to expect a, a, an outcome which is favorable. So that level of matching is really where the machine learning mm. uh, algos come in. And that's really what, uh, you know, Shub's team and, uh, uh, ha has done an immensely good job on. I don't want it to make it only, uh, you know, the, the engineering part of it. There is a, 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 a very nice form of art form of mm. creating the game to make sure that it is fun and engaging. Uh, and that has to be recognized as well. And uh, overlay on top of that, uh, the, the rate of learning that the, the team has. And that's really what sets it up. Absolutely. And it is a craft because at the end of the day, the one the games which work well, they really keep users engaged. In the context of the business model, right? How would you rate uh, MPL's business models and how do you think it survives where others have failed? Because it is a large market, 300 million mobile gaming users. Sure, the broader trends are there. But again, India is a very competitive country. So where do you think MPL succeeds in terms of its business model? where others have failed. So I think 
with, uh, with MPL, they have the advantage of monetizing well on the near term, uh, on the near term. And so they have a successful business of launching a catalog of games, of ensuring uh, skill-based matching, and then uh, participating in that economic stream. So I think they've done that very well. But I would, uh, you know, what excites me as a long-term investor that the company has the optionality in some of the uh, experiments and the projects it's working on, because now they've got this very large uh, distribution uh, or, or traffic opportunity that they have created, where we've got millions of people who come and participate in the games. And that is something that will be revealed sort of shortly by the founders as you speak with them. But uh, it's, it's the optionality there, which I think sets it up well for the All future. Right. And looking into the future, what do you make of MPL's plans? It's expanded into geographies, but we're also seeing that the pandemic induced bump, which was there, between, we saw heady growth years between 2020 and 2021. That's kind of waning as people get back to, uh, you know, the way of way of life that they were used to more physical. So from that perspective of that bump waning, where do you see MPL headed? As the uh, pandemic has waned, what has occurred is a lot of the behaviors that we were doing during the pandemic have, in some cases, reverted to the mean or, in some cases, gone on away. Yeah, in gaming, one of the advantages that MPL profits from is a secular tailwind that, demographically, younger people coming in are constantly more exposed to gaming. Mm. Uh, you can see that with you know, just our kids and and. So you have a natural tailwind of very large funnel that, that is coming in from that engagement perspective. I have always been uh, impressed by the quality that founders here uh, in that they keep reinventing themselves mm. and creating new optionality. And as an investor, uh, that's, the, that's the best you can ask for. Uh, you take the hand that you're given and you make the best of it and then you know, you turn more cards over and that optionality plays out. And so that uh, plays well here. And you hit jackpot. Uh, so clear. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for speaking with us, Dhani. And with that, we come to the end of this episode of ET Brand Equity presents The Big Leap, powered by CleverTap. I hope you enjoyed listening to these leaders and their growth stories. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching. And we'll be back again with the next episode with two more stories. Till then, this is your host, Gautam Srinivasan, signing off. Have a great day.